the delegate Michael Height, the Badger. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, gentlemen. Sounds like you already have a lively debate going on there. <laughs> <laughs> or not lively enough for the crew, though. No, apparently not. <laughs> Uh, so uh, let's see now. You are on uh, February the nineteenth. You guys went into session January the what was it the eighth, ninth something uh, yeah, like that. Eighth or ninth. Yeah. So you're in your home stretch now. Uh, I presume crossover day is not too far uh, from now. And at that point along the way, now it's just about finishing some stuff that's already in the system. What do you have in the system that you think might get through, Michael? Well, I have my fingers crossed. I have uh, a piece of legislation that passed unanimously through the House um, and is in the Senate right now, and that's the West Virginia Consumer Privacy Act of 2024. Um, it's the same one I ran last year and sort of died in the Senate. Um, it, it, uh, it prohibits the credit bureaus from selling your financial information once you uh, fill out a credit app. So I'm hoping that one gets through the Senate this year. Um, and then I have a, a couple other ones. I have a child labor law that's on second reading. And um, Are you in favor of child labor, Mike, or against it? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm in favor of child labor. But uh, <laughs> trust me, I'm getting a lot of pushback from this. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I can't imagine, right? Uh, listen, this, this piece of legislation does not put children in coal mines. I don't know why, what I'm hearing all this pushback from it it's not put them in manufacturing plants this simply states that uh you know a, a child that's at high school age if, if they want to go out to the rec center and work in the concession stand or or keep score or something like that that they're allowed to do so and that they're allowed to do it with their parents permission um and not have to go through the school system to uh get permission to work uh, i'm not sure why we uh why we have to ask the school for permission to work um, parents should be able to make that decision for their kids. What age is the cutoff on this, Mike? Um, well, right now it's 16. I've taken it down to 14, which is about when kids start um, high school. Um, so that's really the only change. Does it uh, exclude a category of jobs, or would it be open to any particular job that's willing to hire a 14-year-old? No, no, no. It, it absolutely excludes certain jobs. You, they, they can't go into coal mines. They can't go into manufacturing. They, there's a, a list of, uh, of particular jobs that they're not allowed to, and, and industries that they're not allowed to be in. How about farming? Can they go out and pick apples in the fall? Sure. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. As long as they're not working around the machinery or anything like that, mm -hmm. um, yeah, they can go pick apples. So Mike, a 14-year-old is a freshman in, in high school. So if if they decide correct. to go out and work, do they still have the requirement to go to school every day and, and, and matriculate yeah, from high school or yeah, part this, of it? This doesn't uh, get in, involved with school. This would have to be after school. They're, the regulations for them to attend school are still there. Uh, if they don't attend, they're still truant, um, and the truancy would be enforced. Is there a limit to the number of hours that they can work, or is and is there a uh, minimum wage that applies to teenagers that's different than adults? Nope. It would all be the same as adults. Uh, I figure that's something that their parents should be able to uh, determine um, with them. And in regards to the first part of the question I asked, numbers number of hours per week, Mike? No. Again, uh, the, the parents can decide that. Mike, going back quickly to the uh, uh, Consumer Privacy Act, uh, this is a national problem, is it? Uh, how do a law that's passed in West Virginia impact what an international company or a national company can or cannot do with their records regarding you? Well, Bill, here in West Virginia, we try to lead the way. Um, <laughs> and that would make it illegal in West Virginia, and I would expect other states to follow suit um, soon after we enact this law. Okay, what teeth do we have, though? How, how do you well, implement the, it? The teeth, the teeth are that they, they can't do it in West Virginia, and if they do, there are provisions in the code that we could um, file suit against them. The Attorney General of the West Virginia would file suit against them, um, and there is a significant amount of money that they would have to pay for each violation. But, Mike, isn't there some similarity between this and the robocalls that we get all the time that, uh, that's supposedly outside of the national, uh, the, uh, on international countries? 
Uh, well, I can't. I don't know that we can uh, regulate the international companies. That's um, that's my point, Mike. Uh, that's my point. Yeah. So this would this this focuses with the credit bureaus, the TransUnion, Equifax, those those bureaus, and anybody else that takes information from a consumer when they fill out a credit application and that that information is passed on from the bank to the credit card agency wherever to the credit bureau neither one of them are allowed to sell any portion of that financial information without your uh, your your opting in uh, to allow that so right now they do um, you, if you fill out a credit application right now to buy your new Tesla um, they will within uh, hours be calling you, sending you emails, um, within days sending you stuff to your, your uh, snail mail mailbox. So this would eliminate that and stop them from doing it. I, I applaud 100% of what you're trying to do. I'm just having difficulty seeing how it can be implemented on an effective level. Well, yeah, that that would be you could file suit, you could file a class action suit through the the AG, or you could file a civil suit uh, with your own lawyer. So that that's how you would implement it. Okay, John Gilstrap, <clears throat> morning, Mike. It's it's I think, and I, I might have the details here wrong. If so, please let me know. There are competing school security, school safety bills that are are going through the the state house. One is uh, would would allow teachers to be armed in in the classroom given certain circumstances and training. The other is uh, a bill. I think it's John Hardy's bill that uh, is funding more SROs to be assigned in schools and not arming the teachers. Any feel that for either whether either is going to go through and or or which one seems to have the most momentum. Well, I, I don't know that they're competing. I think that, you know, you can have a bill that uh, improves the SROs or gives funding for SROs um, and have a bill that allows properly trained teachers to carry arms if they so desire. I don't know why they those two bills would have to be mutually exclusive. Um, I, I know the that at least the teacher carry bill is running through the House right now. Um, and we're hoping to get it done this this week. It'll be on it's on third reading, I think, today. Um, so hopefully it passes and goes on to the Senate. Um, I am, you know, I've made no secrets that I am a, a Second Amendment guy. I do carry, um, and I don't see why we are prohibiting um, teachers from carrying if they have the training and if they so desire. Now I'm not. I don't know that I want to make them SROs. I'm just saying they should be able to carry if they so desire and be able to defend themselves in an area where it seems like, uh, you know, mass shootings mm -hmm. do occur on a regular basis nowadays, unfortunately. And, you know, if, if people are armed in schools, maybe that will cut down uh, that kind of action. Mike, uh, mass shootings, uh, we're on a, a pace to set all sorts of records. Are we as a country becoming hardened toward the impact of hearing about a mass shooting? Um, yeah, I don't know. You know, you, there's guns everywhere. You're not going to get rid of the guns in the United States. I don't care what you do. You, you can try to ban them. That's not going to go away. What you can do is probably arm those citizens who have the training and want to carry and give them the ability to defend themselves if something like this were to happen. Right now, mass shootings in schools, you know, schools are, are, are gun-free zones, except for those who want to come in and, and shoot up. And so I just want to have the ability to uh, give teachers who are properly trained the ability to shoot back and protect themselves and their, their students uh, if they so choose. Delegate Mike Height, our guest on the program. Uh, Mike, a couple of questions for you on some legislation that uh, has been proposed. Uh, just even on your page, uh, just um, whether or not it's getting any traction or not. One of those is HB 5486 to establish the county home rule program as a permanent program. And that was in uh, GovOrg the last I'd seen the progress of it. What's the status of that? 
It's still in Govorg. Um, I'm, I'm trying to work with the, uh, the committee chairman to, to try to run it. Uh, we got like one more, one more committee. Uh, I know it's not on this today's agenda. So I think we got one more committee to get it on the agenda where it dies this year um, on the House side. I don't think there's a Senate version, so it would actually die if we don't get it on the agenda, uh, I think, on Wednesday. So I'm, I'm trying to talk to him, trying to get him to, to move that bill. It's a little tough in an election year to, uh, to get individuals to, to vote on anything that has to deal with with raising taxes, even though we're not raising taxes, it would be giving the uh, the counties the ability to put it to a referendum. So individuals within a county, the constituents, would make that decision of whether or not they want home, home rule or not. Um, but still, it, it, in an election year, it's hard to get people to run that kind of bill. There was a bill to support this bill, which would reduce county commission terms from six years to four because part of the complaint about giving county commissions the ability to have home rule and raise taxes was that it's a six-year term from when they get into when you could vote them out. That's too long. So there was yeah. one to reduce the term to four years. Is, do you know if that's mm -hmm. going anywhere? Yeah, I, I think that was Delegate Kump that enacted that piece of legislation, and um, it's dead. It's, it's not going anywhere. Okay. Bill, you were about to ask. Yeah, I, I was, and I it was uh, dealing with a home rule. Uh, are you getting support from your colleagues from the Eastern Panhandle on this home rule bill? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I, there's. I mean, there's there's some that are opposed to it because they see it as raising taxes. Um, you know, I try to explain to them. You know, you're this is going to a referendum. You, you, we're not raising taxes. You're giving the people the ability to raise taxes on themselves. But um, they still see it as raising taxes. So I, I, there is support with, I would say, the majority of my, uh, my colleagues, but not all of them. Is yeah. there any movement in regards to relaxing the zoning requirement that would, uh, you'd have to have zoning in order to have impact fees? Yeah, the, the impact fees bill um, it, it passed through the Senate. Um, right now, it's in Gov Org as well, and I'm I'm trying to talk to the committee chairman to to move that one as well. So um, the fact that it passed through the Senate overwhelmingly um, gives it a little bit better chance to be run and, and and run over here. The fact that it's a Senate bill means we have a whole lot more time. Um, I don't know that we're going to focus on it this week because we're trying to get all those last. House bills out before crossover day. So um, maybe within the next week or two, we might see that on the agenda too. And, I, and like I said, I'm talking to the, the committee chairman trying to, to push that one along. Are you having a friendly reception trying to push impact fees as opposed to home rule? Um, I don't think one is mutually exclusive of the other. Most people see them as two different bills and, and they do two different things. Um, so uh, I, I get a, a decent reception out of both. I think both of them could go somewhere. Um, the home rule is a little bit more difficult, I think, because people see it as a, a raising taxes. But um, well, well, I Mike, think how, we get to, how, how do they not view impact fees as raising taxes? Uh, well, some some people do see it as raising taxes, but they, if you look at the the constituents within Berkeley County, they see it as raising taxes on those people coming into Berkeley County, and not as much on those who are already here. And also so the it's builders, a new yes. development that they see that that would be paying the people moving into this area would be paying the impact fees. Well, the builders aren't bill you're saying the builders the builders yeah. aren't paying a penny on that. That's going to get passed along to the consumer. It's going to be passed and, along. And the consumer is the person who's buying a newly built house which isn't necessarily a person moving in from out of state. Yeah. You're you're right, but it's that's a true. but it's the one that's actually passing the money are the builders and then they're the builders are being reimbursed by the person buying the house. But uh Mike a technic uh house, still a tax increase. It is in effect it is. It's a much it's a much bigger yeah. tax increase than a sales tax increase of one percent, which might cost you a hundred dollars 
over the course of a year if you spend a lot as opposed to an impact fee on a house, which could cost you eight, ten, twelve, fourteen thousand dollars at once. At yeah. the at the very time that you're already stretched out on on the cash outlay for the house itself. Mm-hmm. But then that money would be embedded in the mortgage, so you don't really see that. Which means that you'd now pay twenty thousand dollars if the impact fee was seven, because when you buy a mortgage, when you get a mortgage in a house for thirty years, you're tripling the amount of money that you borrowed because of interest. But you, the the reverse argument has been used, and I think very used effectively, is that for the demands pace, placed on infrastructure should be covered by the new folks coming into the area. And that in, is in large part what the impact fee does, as opposed to a current resident paying for new water line, it's the builders that's building a new development, mm-hmm. they would be paying for the water line. Uh, and I, I agree with yeah. both philosophies, yeah. by the way. Okay. Go, go ahead, uh, Mike. Let yeah, me... I, I see it as, th- listen, the, the counties um, need that money immediately. They that when people move into the area, the kids go to school immediately, they need water immediately, they need sewer immediately. All those things are needed immediately, and yet it is, uh, you know, up to two, three years before the county can start to recoup um, the money from, you know, the, the regular taxes that the people would start to paying when they come, start paying when they come to this area. So, in essence, the county has to, to fund for a couple of years the, the growth um, without seeing the the money to support it, so it's it's something that's needed more in a growth county than it would in a non-growth county. Yeah, Mike. For clarification, from my part, the clarification from you is we the water district and sewer district have what is basically an impact fee, but a different name, capacity improvement fee. But the bill that you're talking about, that would money would be going to the county. It's that those dollars are not encumbered, are they? They're not directed toward any any particular part of the infrastructure. It's going to be up to the county to make the determination. Is that correct? That's correct. It would be up to the county commission to determine what the the fee would be and what and where that money would go. I, you know, they would. I would think that they would have to direct some of it towards schools. They would have to direct, you know, to those areas that are are affected immediately. It could be fire and, and EMS, it could be schools, it could be you know, anywhere where they deem that that impact is, is most felt. Yeah, now, if they, if this bill does go through, will that uh, relieve, will that remove the ability of the water and sewer districts for charging capacity improvement fees? Uh, that, no. So that would be up to the, the county commissions to, to determine what they need and how they need it. Okay. Hey, Mike, I would kind of want to, kind of a social question uh, for you in terms of the attitude there in uh, in the Capitol during an election year. Uh, you sort of touched on it a little bit in an earlier comment. Is it different? I mean, from where I sit, it seems that last session um, it was just more dynamic and loud, and um, you know people were fighting with each other. And, and it, is it a different vibe in an election year there than it is in the the, the off year? Uh, yeah, I would say so. That the you know people are more subdued. They have to be cognizant of of what they vote for in an election year, and you know if they if they especially if they have opponents, you know, and and how each vote could be construed. So yeah, you know people are, are much more uh, subdued. I would think this year than they are um, in other years. Now, as far as being quiet, I don't know. Sometimes people stand up and bloviate because they need that little sound bite um, for their their campaign. So you see some of that, too. Um, but I would say the bills that were moving um, this year are probably less controversial in some regards than uh, in past. Are there topics that you wish are being brought up but aren't simply because it is an election year and it's better to wait till next year? Yeah, my home rule bill. <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. That's what I keep hearing, you know. We're not running this this year. Well, I, I think yeah, that... I, I think it would pass if we got it through the floor. I just think there are people that are like, no, I, I don't want to put people on a record for this this year. So that that's the issue. So you, that means it's an every other year bill because in the House, every two years you have to stand for election. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, fair enough. Hey, got a minute left, Mike. Uh, anything else you want to make sure people know about? 
Uh, no, not really. I'm just, you know, still working the bills down here, still trying to get uh, things passed and, you know, focusing on right now um, those those particular bills that affect uh, Berkeley County and, and, you know, the people in my district and, and around the, the city and county of, of Berkeley. So um, just trying to make sure that all that stuff gets done before crossover day. And then after that, we'll be uh, working the Senate bills to try to get those passed. Oh, uh, before I go, the uh, the Delta House bill about moving West Virginia's election day up, you say that that's a no-go? Yeah, that, that sort of died uh, on the vine. Um, you know, we, uh, we got some looks like uh, y'all must be crazy. Um, but it's not that it didn't have any support, so I'm going to run it again next year because, you know, some people are looking at this as, you know, look at the economic impact that that would bring to West Virginia with all the people coming here to to campaign. Um, you know, they they would go from Iowa to New Hampshire and then to West Virginia before going to South Carolina. So, you know, I think while it may cost the state uh, four million dollars to have a separate election, um, the the economic impact from all these people coming here to campaign would be uh, would dwarf that so uh that that would be and and we would as a state have uh, uh, some st- say in the game of of who's going to be the nominee for president as it stands right now we vote in may and the decision's already made well here, here's my thought on how you get this passed mike now bear with me for a moment you sure. you, you have how many roommates four <laughs> I, I have four roommates, yes. And and you guys were you, or Daryl can't vote, but the, the four of you as delegates were all in support of this bill, right? That's correct. You see where I'm going? You need to buy a bigger house. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think that's going to happen, Ralph. <laughs> what we need to do is is uh, with the exception of me and Mike, we're from different areas, so. We work on the constituent or we work on those delegates who are from our areas and try to convince them. So Gino can work on his guys and Jimmy can work on his guys. And then Mike sort of has he's sort of like uh, developed a a southern boy type attitude. He he thinks he's from southern West Virginia now. So (laughs) he hangs out with the southern boys and tries to convince them. And then I'm trying to convince the guys in the EP. Old Hoss Hornby. That's what we'll just call him. Old Hoss. Yeah, yeah Hoss. Hoss. Oh, Hoss Hornby. Yeah. <laughs> good to see you, boys. All right. Hey, thank you, Michael. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a good day. Don't Thanks, you, Mike. Don't Fun completely dismiss my thoughts of buying a bigger house, though. Just keep that in mind, though, right? <laughs> I'll keep that in mind.